Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen. And on this week's episode, we welcome the founder and managing partner of the Star of Growth, Randy Garg, to discuss the power of flexible capital in growth stage investing. Randy shares his personal and professional journey across the world of finance, initially at PwC and Discovery Capital, and how he ended up co-founding BD Capital in Vancouver in 2010. Next, we dig into why Randy eventually decided to launch Vistara in 2015 with the blessing of BD Family and their support as his first LP, and how his approach to growth capital evolved since his first fund. Randy and I discuss how Vistara supports his portfolio companies beyond finances in the current climate, and how investments like Zaffin and Core AI ended up being home runs for the firm. Finally, Randy shares the update on the firm's newest fund 5 raise and how they expanded from just family office LPs to now institutional LPs, and what their strategy is with their newest pool of capital. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Randy Garg from the Star of Growth. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Randy. Thanks for having me. You know, Randy, it would be great to get a brief background on yourself for our listeners who aren't so familiar with you and your story. And please share a bit about your personal journey growing up and you know how you ended up in the corporate finance world. I spent a long time working with tech companies and predominantly on the finance side. So I moved out west in 1991 to do my MBA at UBC. And pretty much since then, I've been involved in... Uh, either uh, raising money, investing money, or helping technology companies through uh, various phases of growth. You've had a couple of roles, PwC, Discovery Capital. Talk about those experiences, obviously, before your you know, founding of the Star Growth. Yeah, no, coming out of uh, grad school, I, I launched right into venture capital. I got an interesting opportunity to work with uh, for a local firm called Discovery Capital. They were doing investing in early stage tech companies around British Columbia. So they were looking for a third person to join the team. So uh, I initially got hired on a one-week contract to look at a software company and that one week turned into 12 years. I guess I impressed them uh, to some extent uh, as, a, as a fresh grad. It really stoked my passions of, of getting involved in the tech sector. I did a co-op terms at IBM. My dad worked at IBM for all of his career, so I knew a little bit about tech, uh, but not a lot. But uh, going through venture capital over 12 years and if you think about that time, you know, in the in the late 90s, the run up to the dot com boom and then the bust, uh, it was a great learning time, great experience. Got to work with some amazing local success stories like Sierra Wireless and ALI Technologies and others along the way. It really uh, cemented for me that I wanted to work with uh, with tech companies. So, so I did that for about 12 years and then uh, took a walk on the wild side, went over to the sell side, the investing side being the buy side, but did a little bit on the sell side with, with PwC for a few years. But uh, my passion was really coming back to the buy side. So I got back onto the buy side in around 2010. And you know, just for people who are a bit younger than you and maybe me, the venture capital world as it sort of stood in the dot-com boom wasn't really like the venture capital growth world we see today. What were the major differences back then when it came to the, the capital, the buy side, the strategic players, and sort of the way companies were being viewed and built back then? Yeah, I think back then in the 90s, you still saw business models getting funded as opposed to real software companies, as we have today, where you have real companies that have to develop real software, there's real product market fit. I think there was a lot of experimentation and, and hope and imagination that went on back then, and nobody wanted to miss out. Everybody wanted to make sure that they were part of whatever could become big. But you, you see these shifts over time. You see, you know, the internet uh, brought in an era of uh, of what we see now as cloud computing. It, it really allowed people to imagine forward, and and we saw that with mobile, we saw that with internet, and now we're seeing, I think, that. And we'll get to this later on, but with AI and some other areas. Now, you spent some time at BD Capital. You know, Please explain to our listeners who and what BD Capital is. They've obviously been in the news recently with some of their acquisitions uh, and funding sources. But tell us about that experience and how it shaped your views about the unmet needs for tech companies at the growth stage, which led to obviously the creation of Vistara. Yeah. So back in 2010, I was ready to get back onto the buy side. So I, I did my stint on the sell side, selling the companies I used to put money into. But my passion is really working with entrepreneurs and helping them through the growth journey. So I approached my good friend, Ryan Beatty at the time, a guy I went to MBA school with, as I mentioned earlier, back in 2010 to found Beatty Capital with him. And really, it was following the strategy that we continue to follow today at Vistara and the gap that I had identified in the market for growth stage companies that were looking to access different types of capital at different points in their evolution. Uh, it's, you know, there's times where you can raise debt and there's times where you should be raising equity. And then there's sort of that tweener time where maybe a hybrid or a combination or a, a step is involved there. So if you raise equity, it's permanent capital. It's there until you can get rid of it. 
uh, as opposed to debt, which uh, could fill a need uh, for a certain period of time. So, so at the family office, I was investing their capital. I was co-investing with them along the way in, in every deal that we did and really established that this gap in the market exists. So we did a bunch of deals together, very successful. And then in 2015, uh, decided, okay, this, this platform needs to be bigger. I need to have more than just the one investor. So with the blessing of the family office and the lead order, uh, I was able to go out and uh, create Vistara. And so BD Capital was like a family office that was doing a bit of a hybrid in between like the debt and equity world uh, and the growth world. And you obviously wanted to take that and build that into a broader platform. So I assume it's fair to say that BD was the anchor that allowed you to start the star. But what were those early conversations like when you were pitching LPs to join you on the journey starting Vistara? And what was the initial investment philosophy uh, that you went to market with? Yeah, the strategy since the beginning, uh, from the beginning with BD was flexible growth capital. So again, it's debt, it's convertible debt, it's structured equity, it's combinations thereof, solving for different needs at different points in time. You know, the three core tenets that we always talk about is number one, security, so protect the downside. Number two, some form of yield, i.e. getting paid to wait. And then number three, participate in the upside. So through warrants or conversion features or something. So if you can cover those three, these three things off, uh, I think it, it, is a very sound investment strategy. So proving that out with BD over a dozen plus investments over five years uh, really showed our LPs that, uh, you know, the strategy works. Many of our LPs, uh, and we can get into some of the details around it, many of our LPs are also uh, current or former tech CEOs. Uh, So they've been consumers of capital and they understand that it's not always one type of capital that you should be raising. You should keep your options open. So it really resonated with them. It resonated with other family offices that kind of saw this family office doubling down on on what we were doing. So they were willing to uh, carry on and and support us. So we raised a lot of money pretty quickly and uh, and that kicked us off uh, on fund one and Eight years later now, we've uh, we've raised over $700 million and we're on to fund five. Wow. So your first fund was 2015, I believe. How, was that, how big was that first fund? The first fund was uh, $100 million initially, and then uh, we continued from there. Yeah. And how has your background, I guess, in corporate finance and M&A been integrated, I guess, into the strategy uh, with Vistara? And you know, who have been your biggest competitors? Because you sit on a, a bunch of different points uh, of the company journey whether it's the banks, obviously there's the just pure venture debt providers, and then you know VC funds at that different stage. How do you think about the landscape? On your first question, in terms of my background, the corporate finance M&A background, I think where that really helps in what we do is that first point I mentioned on covering the downside. So you, know, you go into these companies and the VCs are valuing them at whatever multiple they might be valuing them at. I've had the pleasure and the hard work of trying to sell these companies. So understanding what the buyers are actually going to pay for these companies, how they value them, what's most important to the buyers, the investors, um, is really helpful when you're looking at it more from a downside perspective. So you're not just believing the valuation that they got on the last round. It's sort of, okay, what can you actually sell this company for? So I think that background is very, very important coming at it more from a credit perspective. So it's not always about upside. It's about covering uh, the downside. Where we tend to play is we, because we're not shooting for the moon on our deals. We're trying to get kind of one and a half to two and a half X our money on, on every investment. And every now and again, we, we do really well and we exceed that. But for us, you know, when we invest, we're probably investing no more than about uh, 30% of what we perceive the value of the company to be. And that's not what the VCs have valued the company at. This is me calling up, uh, you know, a private equity firm or an aggregator, you know, a constellation software type company. And then what would they pay? What would they pay for it? And then we might lend them up to 30% of that. And then it's really honing in on the, on the key factors and metrics around the company. So gross margins, incredibly important to us. Pricing power is incredibly important. All the typical SaaS metrics around churn and all the hot topics today that founders are just learning about for the first time. It sounds like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's interesting that like you talk about the the calling of the private equity investors. Everyone knows Constellation Software is the most successful uh, you know roll up private equity software buyer out there, but they didn't do it by overpaying, right? They did it by finding the true floor price for an asset and then squeezing what they can out of it. And it sounds like you take that approach too. It's almost like an oxymoron though to say VC, but in a private equity lens, like no one wants to believe that because. 
you know, VCs pay 300% more than what it's worth, hoping that they'll grow into that valuation. So how are you helping the founders think about the capital you give them versus the growth mindset that they've signed up for, I guess? Yeah, no, we very much have a growth mindset. So when I mention private equity firms or the aggregators that are out there, it's that's really when we think about downside. If, if these companies don't achieve their growth ambitions and then they stall out or whatever it is, can we still get our money back for our investors with a decent enough return? Where we do extremely well, and I think what we've shown with a number of our companies, which we can talk about, is these companies have grown incredibly well. They've grown 8x, 10x, where we may have first got involved with them and delivered tremendous value to their investors. And and a big factor also is that the founders have been able to retain way more control, way more ownership of these companies along the way by not doing the the alphabet soup of venture capital, as I call it, where they're just continuing to raise every 18 months the next letter in the alphabet. Yeah, we got some interesting case studies around that. Well, let's talk about those. Obviously, in the news recently is the Zaffin uh, you know, sale to Nordic Capital, but you've been a part of that. What were some of the key factors that made it an attractive investment for Vistara? And how did you approach sort of the challenges of scaling that company? Yeah, so that was a company that I got involved with back in 2013 uh, when I was at the family office. So I was introduced to the founder there by, uh, by a good friend. They had just signed up one of their early big banking customers, so looking for growth capital. But the company was also at a stage where it wasn't quite ready for doing that big institutional equity round. We were able to look forward, I guess, and then find a way to lend the company $5 million at the time, which was a lot of money uh, back then, back in, back in 2013, and really helped institutionalize the company. So our debt at the time was convertible. So we saw the upside potential and we wanted to have the option to convert. We always look for the option to convert where we can, not necessarily the obligation and help the company really get itself, land a few more customers, create a board, create the governance structures around that the VCs are ultimately going to want to see. So a couple of years later, they were able to raise that institutional round. And then we converted um, shortly thereafter as effectively uh, just after that round or part of that round. But if you think about if the founder had raised that early round in equity, they would have given up way more of their company versus when we invested and in our more so how we invested as uh, as debt at the time. So through the through the course of our convertible debt we were then able to as Vistara later in 2016 got reinvolved with the company again uh, did another convertible debt round as the company continued to achieve its milestones it, it essentially to extend the runway from that series A that they had done with the other institutional investor. Fast forward to 2018, uh, Accenture was one of their strategic partners who wanted to invest. What we've seen through a number of our companies is strategics tend not to want to price deals or lead deals, but they're happy to participate in deals. So we actually used our convertible to create the Series B round <clears throat> where we converted, brought in new investors, but also brought in a strategic investor at the time. So it worked out really, really well for the company. Again, able to limit dilution, bring in a strategic partner, and get in enough capital so they could continue to, to run the business. So that was done in kind of 2018 vintage. And if you think of it, that was the last capital the company raised. So since then, it's, it's very capital efficient. It's done incredibly well. It's been basically built off of cash flows and culminating with uh, last week's news that uh, it was bought by a, a large European private equity fund. And can you share sort of like how big of a sort of difference in what you underwrote for versus what it ended up being for the fund uh, in terms of uh, the LP's happiness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the terms, the financial terms of the deal were not disclosed, so I'm not at liberty to, to share those. Uh, I think what I can share is from the time that we invested in the company, you know, back in 2013, the, the ARR, the, the size of the company was, was 10x to where it exited now. So great IRR, but you know, in, in my world, you can't eat IRR. You got to eat, uh, exactly. you, you got to distribute capital. So uh, this is, yeah, this, this is basically <laughs> returning the fund again for our LPs. Uh, they've already, this is back, this is back in our fund two. We're now on the fund five. They've already got all their money back and then some, and now they're going to get it back again. You know, for our founders listening out there, the way I think about uh, how they should view Vistara is that it's not equity, so it's not immediately dilutive. It's flexible capital, so it doesn't have uh, the same covenants probably as what you know term debt or venture debt would have, given that it has that conversion feature to it. Is there anything else founders out here should be listening to 
and understand the structural part of the capital you provide that differentiates it from the debt side? I think equity is clear, but maybe focus on the debt difference. We actually call it growth debt, not venture debt. And the distinction really is venture debt, by definition, uh, is debt that you receive often from banks, but there's other venture debt providers out there. And, and really, that's after you've just raised a fresh venture capital round. So in many respects, the bank or the other lender is really underwriting against the sponsor in the deal, more so than the underlying company itself. Whereas we got involved with you know companies like Zaffin, companies like Core, and others where there hasn't there hadn't been that institutional round in the companies. We're really betting on the founder, betting on the company, and providing that growth debt versus growth equity. Where we can, we look to do convertible debt with the uh, intention of becoming equity down the road. Many of our founders and CEOs actually call us rental equity. <laughs> so they're, they're renting the capital, they're achieving their objectives, they're growing the business, getting to certain milestones, getting to a better valuation. It's a whole different world when a company is doing 10 million of ARR, which is typically where we start at, in terms of the size. If you can get the company up to 20, 30 million of ARR using more flexible, less dilutive capital like that, you can get way better terms when, when you do actually go and raise that equity round. That makes perfect sense. I love that. Rental capital. That's a great term. But the, the current state of private credit is very confusing to some founders. So can you maybe explain what you're seeing out there, especially with the venture back companies that maybe sort of hit that top mark in 2021, early 22, and maybe flatlining now at 5, 10, 15 million of ARR? How are these companies going to be viewed by people like you? And, and what are you seeing out there in general? On the equity side, you know, venture capital is <clears throat> still a bit of a challenge place in terms of uh, companies catching up to the valuations that they that they got three four years ago. Many of the funds are kind of caring for their existing deals versus versus really looking at new deals. On the debt side of the equation, before the SVB collapse effectively, a lot of banks were lending to these companies. So the Canadian banks were were quite aggressive. The U.S. banks were very aggressive. Lending money to companies that hadn't really got to the level that, that you would typically see a bank providing capital to. But they were they were lending to companies that had raised fresh venture capital. Now, these companies have all been burning since then. So now you're getting to a point where the companies have burned through a lot of that equity capital. And they're coming up on renewals. They're coming up on their amortization periods because banks often give you money early on and it's interest only. But then eventually you got to start amortizing the principal and then paying that back. So we're seeing a lot of opportunities right now where that amortization period is coming on or the renewals coming on and the risk appetite has just dwindled dramatically. In the non-bank world where we play, you either have venture debt or you have our style of growth debt, as we call it. So for venture debt providers, they're looking for fresh venture capital to be coming into these companies. And that's harder to come by. Fewer financing rounds going on right now. I would argue that companies, in many cases, should bite the bullet and just look for that equity capital where they can get it and not worry about the stigma of a down round or, or whatever it is. You know, Regardless, these companies aren't getting as much on the venture capital side. So therefore, the venture debt is less and less available. Yeah, but the venture debt, the venture equity is coming with like two, three x liquidation sure, preferences. Sure, They're probably making up, maybe making up for past sins, maybe making up for whatever it is, right? Hey, I think it's right. I mean, if it's a million dollar or two million dollars, you know, what's another? You know, if it's a three x liquidation preference, what's another six million on top of the pref stack of fifty? Exactly. So that so that kind of is what it is. I think from our perspective. Again, going back to our three core tenants of security, yield, and upside, if I have a company doing $20 million of ARR and maybe it didn't hit the growth projections that the VCs were looking for, but it's still $20 million of ARR, it's still 70 80% gross margin, maybe it's growing at 10 to 20%, not 40 to 80% like the VCs want to see, that's still a pretty solid company and solid credit. And over the past couple of years, they've also typically... Uh, from what we've seen, cut their burn rate and figured out their true product market fit, not chasing rainbows and doing crazy stuff, going after things that actually pay off. So I think when we see that discipline in companies, when we see strong unit economics, you know, they've lasted through whatever this downturn has been. Customers have stuck with them. Their, you know, the gross retention is close to 90%. Their net retention is hopefully a little over 100%. That's still a solid company for us. It may not be, though, for equity investors. 
we're seeing a, a ton of opportunity with companies that maybe aren't growing as fast. They're still growing, but they're still very solid businesses. Okay. Well, talk to me about the public market for small cap tech, because we've obviously seen your former uh, employer having to basically convert their debt into equity and acquiring Think Research, for example. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of these like zombie public tech companies out there? What do you think happens there? I've never really been a big public guy and I'm not involved. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not involved in beta capital in any way. They're just, they're an investor with us now. But, um, <clears throat> I think the Canadian public market is kind of private companies on a public exchange to a large degree. If you're talking about the U.S. public markets, it's good to see some glimmers there with companies that are, that are coming out. I think Reddit's the latest that, uh, that should come out. So that creates some liquidity. That creates some DPI for funds that they need to get money back to their LPs so they can reload into these funds and keep the cycle going. On the, on the Canadian side, I guess over my 30 plus years, that's never really been a true liquidity option. It's been a fundraising option for companies, but it doesn't really drive the liquidity that you typically want to see when you IPO a company. You want to create liquidity for your early shareholders. Uh, on the Canadian side, it, it's, it's kind of more like another financing event. And then you got to see how the companies do. One of our companies, ALI Technologies, back in the I guess in the nineties went public and they've languished at whatever, two, three bucks a share or something like that forever. And ultimately it got bought by McKesson for half a billion dollars, but the public markets didn't really do anything for them. The, the public markets kind of reacted as a company performed. They didn't really go out and raise money or, or do any acquisitions or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, the Canadian public markets for small cap tech companies is incredibly disconnected. Uh, and I think these companies should stay private for much longer or not even think about going public until they really hit the mark for what investors care about. Yeah, it comes in waves. You know, we had a we had a big grouping of these companies go public a while back. You had guest logics, I remember. That was a different one that we lent them some money to do an acquisition. Uh, we typically work with with private companies. So I was referring more to some of these other ones that went public. You know, you get to kind of fifty to hundred million of of ARR and, and maybe it makes sense to do an IPO in the Canadian uh, context. Uh, so you have, you know, Copper Leaf and companies like that, that, that you see on the, on the local scene, it hasn't really played out that way. And I think you're seeing a lot of these companies now st going private again. And, you know, they haven't seen the liquidity. They don't see the trading volumes or any of that that you see in the U S yeah. Like 5% of their float trades, but it prices the company at like, you know, two times revenue. Speaking of growth, you know, in AI, you had a, an incredible investment that you converted, I believe, from uh, debt to equity in core.ai. Can you talk about the rapid growth that core had going from 10 to 100 million in ARR and the role that Vistar played in supporting that journey and, and how you thought about deciding to convert your debt to equity? Yeah, no, this is a company, uh, you know, in Orlando, Florida, which is, I can get to Europe quicker than I can get to Orlando from Vancouver, um, <laughs> based on flights. But we were introduced back in 2018. They were doing single digit million uh, of ARR. But what they did is they, they talked to us about a number of the customers that they were, they were trying to land. And we reconnected with them a year later and we name checked all those customers and they actually landed all those customers. So Citibank, PNC, Cigna, eBay, you name it. So this is a, a platform that allows enterprises to build virtual assistants or chatbots um, and uh, enterprise grade. So there's a lot of chatbot providers, but this uh, allows an enterprise to create their, their own virtual assistants based on their policies, procedures, regulations, et cetera. Yeah. We have a company similar to that called VoiceFlow. Right. Right. So, you know, we, we looked at how they had achieved all their goals. And so in 2019, we did a we, we look to do a convertible debt round. Again, this is a founder that owned majority control of his business. This was his fifth company. He had invested a ton of his own money back into this business. So it had all those right characteristics. Now, a venture debt provider would never do that deal because it didn't have venture capital attached to the company at the time, a sponsor attached to the company. So, so we got in, we did a convertible debt deal. We really liked the ongoing progress of the company. The numbers have, have kind of have played out very nicely. We converted that debt. We, in fact, helped uh, you know, lead the round uh, effectively That where uh, NVIDIA came in, PNC Bank came in back in 2019, who were, in one case, in, with NVIDIA, a strategic partner, with PNC Bank, uh, a customer wanted to become a shareholder of the business. So we were very keen on supporting them through that. Again, they couldn't lead or price the round. So we did that through our convertible. 
continued to work with the company. Uh, we did another round uh, uh, sort of more recently back in 2021. As we just saw uh, a few months ago, um, FTV Capital came in. Uh, NVIDIA continued to support the company, doing a $150 million round into the company. So this is a core of AI is 10x their ARR from when we first got involved. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these companies that is real in the whole AI hype cycle that we're going through right now. They've actually got real enterprise customers that are showing real time savings, cost savings, efficiencies, et cetera. So we're, uh, we're thrilled to support these guys. That's incredible. I mean, you know, talking about AI and, and your involvement with Core, what other things are you looking for now, given the market is so bifurcated between these like zombie-esque overly funded venture companies and the AI overly valued companies that may not have strong fundamental businesses just yet? when you come to the decision on whether to give them convertible debt or not? You know, every now and again, you get the exciting ones like Core and, and Zaffa, and then we've got a couple others that we're really excited about. Brim Financial's got, uh, I think, incredible potential as well as, as we look forward here in our portfolio. But we also got a bunch of just very steady B2B SaaS companies. We try to go to market by vertical, so we have a, a focus on fintech. We have a focus on DevSecOps, so cybersecurity, DevOps tools, uh, IT infrastructure, uh, we just hired somebody to focus on healthcare IT. So again, we want to be different than your normal lender. We want to be able to go in and know something about the industry, know something about their competitors, and, and really try to help them as a growth partner. So I wouldn't say we're chasing you know, anything .ai. We need to see real ARR. Uh, and, that, and B2B uh, is, is really the focus. We don't chase consumer. We don't chase the heavy burn rate companies. So our model is very much you know, hit singles and doubles and you get the occasional home run or in some cases, grand slams with uh, the cores and the Zaffins. But uh, it's really just hit those singles and doubles all day long. Well, it's obviously worked out because you had a successful first close on fund five of 150 million US. You know, talk to us about that fundraising process, given the co context of the market and what your strategies are for employ uh, employing the next close towards $400 million target. We did our last investment out of Fund 4 in October. Uh, we opened up Fund 5 mainly to our existing investors. Uh, same way we track our SaaS companies, our net dollar retention figures are pretty high. So that initial 150 got subscribed for in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, and that was largely all our existing LPs uh, re-upping. We're doing a top-up close here. We'll be closer to 200 uh, in the next week or so. And then the monies that have been raised since the beginning have largely been through personal networks. So we've, we've kind of done it either the hard way or the, or the different way where we haven't gone institutional. I think this is a story of a lot of Canadian fund managers and maybe who might be listening to this, is many of these funds aren't really big enough for the big pension funds or institutional investors. So at 400 million US, we're now finally big enough that we can talk to some institutions and we're a fund five and we have our track record and, and all of that. So it's a very different pitch now where you can go and talk to an institutional investor that might be able to put in 40, 50, 100 million into, into our style of fund, given the size and, and given the track record. So that's really our intention with the back half of the fund. Hopefully we'll get that done over the next quarter or two where we raise the balance of it. For us, in our world, we're writing 10 to $30 million checks per company. So on average, about 20. These are all U.S. dollars that I'm referring to. So we're really looking at doing 18 to 20 odd deals in the fund. We see probably 800 plus deals a year and we're doing eight or 10 deals a year. So every couple of years in our model, we, we tend to be uh, fully invested out of whatever fund that we're in. And then we move on to the next fund. So a $200 million fund is 20 companies, you're saying? So does that mean a 40, $400 million no, no, fund? Four, 400 million. So does the, the, if 200 mean that you do half the companies or just half the check size? More half the companies. We intend, we expect to raise the full fund. We're not, uh, we're not done. We, we achieve our, we try to achieve our targets and so far we have. So um, I fully expect that we'll get to the 400 and we'll get to the 20 some odd companies that we intend to invest in. That's fantastic. And just so I know, is there a reserve strategy in your model or how does it work in you know, convertible debt and, you know, that world? Yeah. So we, unlike uh, many venture funds, we don't need to reserve 30%, 40% of our fund. We have historically got to 90% invested in our funds uh, with about 10% on reserve. And that's worked out just fine for us uh, along the way. So uh, we've done the same in terms of our prior funds. Um, funds one and two are all fully returned now. Fund two will be shortly with the Zaffin exit. 
uh, fund three, we've already returned 90% of the capital to our LPs and there's a whole bunch more waiting to come back to them. So in a credit model, private credit, the velocity is a bit quicker uh, versus the 10 to 12 year venture model. We've been able to deploy and return capital to our LPs within more of a six year time horizon. And that's part of the reason I think why we see the our LPs coming back and, and reinvesting with us so quickly because they are effectively reinvesting or recommitting capital. They know they're in fund five that they know they're going to be getting out of fund three. They're kind of with us at two funds at a time. The DPI of, of you know one X on a six year life is incredible compared to traditional venture. That's correct. Um, you know, in terms of uh, private credit and how you guys are structuring your deals. How does the uh, structure with the way interest rates move so quickly over the last year and a half get inserted in the structure you have for your convertible notes? I assume they're not just like a 7.5% interest cost versus prime plus 3% or how does it work for you guys? Yeah, so our our deals are all floating rate deals. And and to be clear, Matt, not all of our deals are convertible. So some of them are just straight three to five year term debt with some warrants attached to them. But on the interest rate side of things, it is US prime plus a spread. Uh, what we've done is, as the rates have escalated, you know, ultimately these companies are growth companies and need capital to grow their businesses. What we've done is we've, in some cases, capped the cash pay component uh, of what they're paying in monthly interest and accruing the balance of it. But for our investors, they ultimately get uh, the benefit of, uh, of rising rates. And we've also got floors in there uh, just to protect uh, on the on the downside. So ultimately, this is more expensive than bank debt, but if you believe in your equity, it's way cheaper than issuing equity. Flexible rental equity and flexible capital for sure. Awesome. Well, you know, what should we uh, look forward to with Vistar's growth for the future and some of the opportunities that you anticipate to have the ability to deploy capital to in the next several years? You know, the gap that we've traditionally served in the market going back to the family office fund and now Vistara has always been there. We see the gap. That gap has widened dramatically as the banks have retreated on one end and venture capital has retreated on the other end. So we, uh, we're we we're super excited to raise the rest of our fund. We've already done four deals in the fund. We're only you know, half raised, but we were, we're, we're off to the races on deployment already. That'll be the focus is raising the balance of the fund, continuing to deploy, growing our team. We're now uh, soon to be 16 people split evenly between Vancouver and Toronto. The ability to attract talent also in this environment is pretty good. Uh, we're getting some great opportunities to bring on people on the team, maybe from traditional investment firms or banks or whatnot. So just start to see a lot more from us. And many of the companies that we invested in, like the Zaffins and the Cores, etc., you're going to see some pretty interesting announcements from them as well on exits, big financings, because they've now grown through the cycle with us uh, along the way. That's fantastic. I mean, I feel like we're uh, birds flying, crossing over in the night with us opening offices in Vancouver with our partner Dom now based in Vancouver and you're in Toronto. We should be definitely doing more co-branded uh, events together to help build out the community together. And before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorite. So first off, your favorite podcast. Uh, I think it's a pretty popular one now, but I still love Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy and uh, and the business breakdowns as well. You know, every so often you you get to listen to one I enjoyed was a business breakdown in the NFL. Uh, so actually, I'm a big fo- a big football fan, but understanding the business behind it. If you like that one, you gotta you gotta do the acquired FM breakdown of the NFL. That one was phenomenal. Have you heard of the acquired FM podcast? No, but I'll look it up acquired. They're fantastic. They did one on Costco. They've done one on Louis Vuitton. They do like, you know, three hour style deep dives into things. And the NFL was amazing. But uh, yeah, Patrick Ashani, best like the best is obviously up the top of the list. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. So I'm a bit of a kind of a news junkie. I, I get it from a number of different sources. Uh, I love Bloomberg is sort of my my blitz in the morning on, on what's going on in the world and in business, Wall Street Journal, Globe and Mail on the Canadian side, so I get little bits and pieces from from all of them as my uh, as my sort of daily daily update on the world. Uh, TechCrunch, I think I don't know where, I know where TechCrunch is going with. I think they're getting rid of TechCrunch Plus or something from what I heard, but uh, that was another good one. Yeah, they have. Asian has picked up a lot of the slack for TechCrunch. Next is your favorite tech gadget. Well, I finally. I uh, bought one of those Peloton Bike Pluses. Uh, I was using the app and doing the hack version for many years, but I got the Bike Plus and I absolutely love it. I was I was cheating like crazy with my Kaiser bike and the app and the big screen TV. So now I'm now I'm being kept honest by my uh, 
my bike plus. Like a true true debt investor, you waited for the thing to drop ninety percent and, and paid uh, <laughs> less than you would in the public market. You know, I'm a credit guy, so you wait for all the discounts and the free months and the and the this and the that, and then there you go. The credit mindset applies to personal and professional investments. It's in the blood. It's in the blood. Next is your favorite new trend. I don't know if it's a trend. It's just, I, I think just the attention being uh, put on all things health uh, is important right now. You know, we get caught in the rat race of just growing, 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 and running, running, running. Just sort of that, you know, pause and reflect. Don't start your morning staring at your phone kind of thing. Do a little meditation or do something. So just the attention on health, I, I would say, is, uh, I think, refreshing. Very refreshing. I completely agree with that one. Uh, next is your favorite new book or favorite book of all, all time? I start a lot of books. I, I rarely finish them <laughs> just because it's uh, with all the travel and everything. Uh, so I'm halfway through Elon's autobiography. One that I just finished, though, that I really loved was Outlive, Peter Attila's book. So um, I think, again, on the health theme, just uh, you know, the concept of uh, health span versus the lifespan. So living a long life, but living it healthy as opposed to just living a long life is uh, is an important thing. Yeah, I agree. That's why I keep telling my wife, I got to keep getting my annual ski trips in because I'm not going to be physically healthy to do them until I'm 90. So that's the uh, the way I sell it to her. <laughs> and last but not least, your favorite life lesson. My favorite life lesson has always been bet on yourself. Um, I'm not a big gambler. I don't go to Vegas and do all that kind of crazy stuff. But the the one bet that I will always place is on myself. When I started the family office fund or joined a tiny little VC fund or started Vistara, uh, it was easy to kind of go and just get a job somewhere. But if you bet on yourself and you look to create something, have the belief that you can always get a job. So if, if you have the gumption and the wherewithal to go start something and be your own boss and bet on yourself, do it 100% of the time. That's what I tell my kids. That's what I tell anyone who bothers to listen to me. I agree with you a million times. So I didn't ask you, why did you name the firm Vistara? I was hunting around A, for what was available on GoDaddy, but Vistara is a Sanskrit word for expansion. So in the early days, there was actually an airline in, in India called uh, Vistara Airlines, but the, the Sanskrit definition of Vistara is expansion. And if you think about what we do, it's really about enabling uh, expansion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense now. Well, thanks so much for joining us in the tank today with Randy Garg from Vistara Growth. Thank you, Matt. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tank Talks. We hope you found today's conversation as insightful as we did. If you're enjoying the show, we've got three quick things to ask of you. First, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or YouTube. Next, follow us and stay up to date on upcoming episodes and behind-the-scenes content on social media with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And lastly, share the love. If you found value in today's episode, share with a friend or colleague who'd benefit too. Your support helps us bring in more amazing guests and keeps the Tank Talks engine running. That's it for today. Until next time, keep disrupting and innovating.